uh, our um, next talk is um, also a different topic by a distinguished speaker, a dear uh, friend and teacher uh, uh, for myself, uh, Professor Nazarino Gallier from Italy. Uh, Professor uh, Nazarino Gallier uh, is actually a cardiologist uh, by training, and he is going to talk to us about the pulmonary hypertension uh, as a topic. He has uh, he is uh, from the University of Bologna, uh, Italy, and he has attended the Royal Postgraduate Medical School at the University of London Hammersmith uh, Hospital in London, UK. And he was a research fellow at the Division of Cardiology at the University of Arkansas in the USA at the Little Rock. Um, and uh, he is a full professor of cardiology at the Department uh, of Experimental Diagnostic and Specialty Medicine, Dines, of the uh, Nebel University in Italy. Uh, Professor Gallier has been the chairperson of the task force uh, for the practice guidelines 2004 to 2009 um, and 2015 for pulmonary hypertension at the European uh, Society of Cardiology and the European Society, uh, Res European Respiratory Society. We had the privilege pre-COVID era to uh, have Professor Galli visit us in the UAE. And I was honored by his invitation to Bologna, Italy um, many years ago. Um, uh, professor Gallier, we had a pulmono we had a pulmonologist, uh, Professor Bevert from uh, Oxford University, who said earlier that cardiologists are smarter than pulmonologists. I told him now we have a cardiologist coming up uh, this afternoon, and uh, that's that's going to complicate things. So uh, I do admit that uh, you having two hats, managing as a cardiologist and a pulmonologist, gives you an edge. For uh, in this field. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to participate with us today. And it's always an honor to meet uh, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your kind uh, presentation. And I can start uh, saying that the pulmonary hypertension is a multidisciplinary uh, clinical uh, uh, disease. And uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, we will start with definitions, then diagnosis, uh, and then the three larger groups uh, of pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease, to lung disease, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. According to the current guidelines, pulmonary hypertension is not uh, a disease, but a pathophysiological condition characterized uh, by an hemodynamic definition as assessed by right heart catheterization. The guidelines suggest mean pulmonary arterial pressure more or equal to 25 millimeters of uh, mercury. And it includes uh, a precapillary and the postcapillary form. Pulmonary hypertension can be found in more than 50 clinical conditions. This outline how important uh, is diagnosis. Very recently, a proposal to reduce the threshold for the diagnosis from 25 to 20 has been proposed. We will see if this will be also reflected in the guidelines, the new guidelines that are currently on the phase of implementation. Why this reduction of threshold? Because in several retrospective analyses, the increase of mortality of patients with uh, uh, right heart catheterization start uh, at uh, the threshold of 20. However, it's not clear if this phenomenon is due to pulmonary hypertension per se or due to the underlying lung or left heart disease. And this is the clinical classification, very important for five groups, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is uh, the expected uh, percentage of uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension, so rare disease. The largest group is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. The second largest 
pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, then another rare condition, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and a, a group of multifactorial mechanisms. The, the pathology is different according to this clinical classification. If uh, this is uh, uh, distal pulmonary arteries, uh, which diameter is, is less than half millimeter, and you see how the lumen is large and the wall is thin. This is what happens in PAH, a very relevant obstructive cell proliferation. This is left heart disease. Left heart disease includes uh, obviously interstitial edema and some thickening also of the vessel wall of the arteries, distal pulmonary arteries, but not so extreme like uh, in PAH. For lung disease, uh, there is a more complex uh, uh, picture according to the different condition, obstructive or restrictive. There is uh, an anatomical also obliteration of vessels in areas of emphysema and then fibrosis. And also in this case, the precapillary component on the distal pulmonary arteries exists, but is not uh, so relevant like in PAH. And this is chronic thromboembolic uh, pulmonary hypertension. There is uh, an hybrid uh, uh, zone, uh, different zones uh, with uh, either complete proximal obstruction or distal obstructions and also non-obstructed uh, areas in which there is an increase of perfusion and pressure and the changes are similar to those observed in group one, PAH. The diagnosis uh, is important uh, and we should not confuse systemic hypertension in which 95% of the patients uh, have uh, uh, the same uh, uh, disease, not uh, secondary, while in pulmonary arterial hypertension is the opposite, only 10% is a condition in which we do not know the mechanisms. The majority of the patients will have a left heart disease and lung disease. So the diagnostic process in pulmonary hypertension has to be more accurate as compared to systemic hypertension. And we should not confuse, confuse the two conditions. Uh, the pulmonary pressure can be estimated by echocardiography, but not measured we need to uh, uh, understand the difference. An estimate is not so precise like a measurement, which can be uh, achieved by right heart catheterization. When uh, then we need uh, to be sure about the level of pulmonary hypertension, the right heart catheterization is uh, better as compared to the estimation by echocardiography. And echocardiography not only provide an estimation of the pressure, but also uh, anatomical uh, picture. Uh, typical is the dilatation of the right heart chambers, the reduction in size of the left heart chambers, and in advanced cases also uh, pericardial effusion. So echo is very important, uh, but should not be utilized only to estimate the pressure. And this is... Uh, the reason, because uh, the guidelines uh, propose uh, not sp specific measurements, but uh, a probability of the presence of pulmonary hypertension. So low, intermediate, and high probability according to the velocity of tricuspid regurgitation and uh, according to the presence uh, or absence uh, of other signs of pulmonary hypertension, uh, like uh, the dilatation uh, of uh, the right heart uh, ventricle or the, uh, the right heart atrium, the dilatation of the pulmonary artery and the inferior vena cava. All these uh, um, uh, dilatations uh, increase uh, the likelihood of the presence uh, of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, as I said, it's extremely important, the diagnostic process. We need to define precisely which type of pulmonary hypertension as uh, the patient and uh, after uh, the confirmation uh, of uh, an echocardiography 
of high or intermediate probability, then we need to perform a series of analysis to identify the presence or absence of left heart disease and lung disease. This is a most important part because it will, uh, uh, we have to decide if we go forward or just stop because we have found the cause for pulmonary hypertension in case of left heart disease or lung disease. When we have excluded then left heart disease and lung disease, we try to identify the presence of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension by uh, ventilation, perfusion, lung scan, and then uh, additional examinations, uh, including uh, the pulmonary uh, CT uh, angiography. And in this case, the patients need to be referred to an expert center because today, this is uh, CTE CTEF is a condition which is treatable by different uh, uh, strategies, and we will uh, discuss them uh, later on. If we do not identify CTEF at this point here, we have a high probability of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And in this case, uh, it's important uh, to perform the right heart catheterization with vasoreactivity test and to identify possible condition which uh, are associated to pulmonary arterial hypertension like connective tissue disease, congenital heart disease, drug and toxins, portopulmonary hypertension, HIV infection, and schistosomiasis. At the end, if nothing is found, then the pulmonary hypertension is considered idiopathic or heritable after screening for mutations. And we have also to consider a rare condition like pulmonary venoclusive disease, which can be uh, masked uh, uh, when we compare to idiopathic and uh, it's important uh, to have the suspicion in particular when the patients do not respond appropriately to the first drug uh, prescription. This is the right heart catheterization. It can be performed by an internal jugular vein and this can be performed in the hospital and uh, with this Schwangans catheter we can absolutely have a precise hemodynamic profile and also a measurement of the left atrial pressure to identify precapillary or postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. Only patients with left heart disease have postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. All the other groups have a normal wedge pressure and then the pulmonary hypertension is uh, precapillary. This is just to remember you the numbers uh, of uh, normal uh, uh, pulmonary hemodynamics. So the mean pulmonary arterial pressure is 13 with a range from 8 to 20. And also it's important to assess uh, uh, the right atrial pressure to ide identify right uh, um, art uh, failure. And uh, uh, also the uh, cardiac index to identify uh, the, the flow of uh, the, uh, through the lungs. And then this will allow us to calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance. This is just to show you rapidly the nitric oxide test, which is important in patients with the idiopathic form to identify a specific type which responds, uh, which respond well to calcium channel blockers. Left heart disease, the most frequent form, we have uh, three phenotypes, uh, left heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with the preserved ejection fraction with valvular disease. The hemodynamic profile is the same and is completely different from pulmonary arterial hypertension. In fact, there is no proof that the drugs approved for PAH are effective in left heart disease. And also the pathophysiology is completely di different because we have a, a pressure pushing back uh, to the lungs uh, instead that uh, uh, in precapillary form, we don't have uh, this uh, flow going back uh, uh, into the uh, pulmonary uh, veins. 
And also it's important to notice that uh, if we have patients uh, with severe uh, left heart disease, they need uh, uh, left ventricular assist device. If we are able with this uh, um, assist device to normalize the wedge pressure, also the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, go down. What does it, does it mean? It means that this is the treatment for pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Normalize, if possible, sometimes it's not possible, the wedge pressure. And we have different studies negative with drugs approved for PAH like sildenafil. In this study, in patients with valvular heart disease and pulmonary hypertension, there is an increase of events with sildenafil. And uh, these are 12 studies with drugs approved for PAH. Um, and these are negative studies, but not only negative. There is a trend to the increase of mortality in patients treated with uh, active uh, uh, drugs uh, as compared to placebo. Lung disease, lung disease, we have already seen the possibility to have pulmonary hypertension into two phenotypes, obstructive and restrictive. And also it's important to identify uh, specific phenotypes of uh, uh, emphysema and uh, fibrosis in the lungs. This combination uh, may, may not be captured by the volumes, but by the, the DLCO and by the high resolution CT scan. This may be typical of smokers, but uh, you know this uh, better than me. And uh, this is in any case of very severe conditions despite the normal volumes measured by the volumetry. And uh, it's important uh, to try to clarify if the patient uh, has uh, a pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, uh, because this uh, will uh, uh, suggest us uh, if uh, to perform uh, a test with drugs uh, approved for PAH or not. Why we need to be very cautious in using drugs approved for PAH? Because we have data of increase of mortality. This is lung fibrosis with pulmonary hypertension. The addition of, of ambrisentan increase the mortality as compared to placebo. And the same with riosiguat. Again, patients with, uh, with lung fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension, the addition of riosiguat increased the mortality as compared to placebo. And also after crossover, former placebo uh, taking riosiguat increased the mortality uh, as compared to people former in riosiguat. Again, uh, this is uh, the um, treatment uh, is the diagnostic uh, table. And then uh, the drugs are approved for PAH, are approved for some patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but they are not approved and not recommended in patients with pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease and lung disease. These are the recommendation of uh, uh, the uh, proceedings of the world meeting, the last world meeting on pulmonary hypertension. So chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, we have already discussed the different zones and for each zone, we have a specific treatment. For proximal obstruction, endoarterectomy is required. For intermediate lesions, balloon pulmonary angioplasty is required. And uh, in the non-obstructed areas uh, in which uh, the same distal disease as PAH is present, uh, the drugs can be effective. So this is uh, an obstructive condition and patients cannot be treated only with drugs. Patients need to be assessed in an expert center in which both uh, procedures are available, endoarterectomy and balloon pulmonary angioplasty, and then uh, after uh, this procedure, uh, they can also be treated with, uh, uh, be treated with drugs. And this is uh, the algorithm uh, for treatment. Of course, patients need to be anticoagulated uh, lifetime. And then the 
CTF team assess if the patient is operable or not operable. Operable patients are operated by endarterectomy, not operable, are considered for balloon pulmonary angioplasty and medical therapy. This is our program, and it's important to have an um, uh, uh, updated uh, system. This is uh, the biplane uh, uh, X-rays uh, to performing uh, balloon pulmonary angioplasty. It's important also to have uh, the re reconstruction of the vessels to identify and plan multiple sessions of balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Uh, there are uh, 24 segments uh, and uh, it's important uh, to explore all of them to reduce uh, the obstruction in patients not operable and with uh, uh, distal, uh, distal lesions. This is uh, our uh, group uh, is uh, a multidisciplinary group uh, with the cardiac surgeons, uh, radiologists, interventional radiologists, cardiologists, uh, and interventional also cardiologists. And finally, group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension. As uh, we have seen uh, in the diagnostic algorithm, this, uh, the, these patients uh, are uh, diagnosed by exclusion. And also in this case, we have an heterogeneity of clinical conditions, the idiopathic form, the form related to congenital heart disease, to connective tissue disease, to HIV infections, to portal hypertension, to schistosomiasis and to drugs and toxins. And the first things after the correct diagnosis is the stratification of the risk. The patients may be considered at low risk or intermediate risk or at high risk according to a clinical evaluation, an exercise capacity, and right ventricular function. And this uh, specific table of the guidelines has been uh, uh, supported by retrospective analysis of three international uh, uh, registries. In Bologna, we have uh, simplified the stratification utilizing uh, uh, four uh, risk criteria for the precise uh, identification of low risk patients, intermediate risk patients and high risk patients. And the low risk represent our goal of therapy. We should not uh, be satisfied to keep the patients only in functional class one and two, so with few symptoms. We need to have few symptoms, but a good exercise capacity and a good profile of uh, hemodynamics uh, uh, like uh, cardiac index and also anti-proBMP. So not only clinical evaluation may tell us uh, if the patient is in the uh, goal of our treatment. And the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension is uh, uh, based on evidence. These are, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, 42 randomized control studies, which have been uh, um, uh, intercepted by the guidelines and uh, with different uh, st uh, treatment strategies, monotherapy, sequential combination, and initial combination. And these are the studies uh, who have been performed. I will say towards uh, to the last uh, studies, the last generation study, because the primary endpoint is morbidity and mortality. And as you can see, these studies are longer and larger. And uh, this is the Seraphine study for Macitentan, which uh, uh, is effective, and we will see also in combination therapy. The Griffon is uh, the study of Selexipag, an agonist of the prostacycline receptor, uh, which is uh, orally available, and uh, the ambition, the combination of an endotrine receptor antagonist and the PD5 inhibitors at the beginning, just initial combination therapy. And this is the Seraphine study and showing the improvement of outcome in case of addition of macitentan to uh, a PD5 inhibitor, which may be sildenafil or tadalafil. And this is uh, the Griffon study. So the addition of selexipag 
improve the outcome in patients already treated in double, with double combination therapy. So triple oral combination therapy, you see, is effective on the outcome. And this is the ambition study. If we start with the double combination, uh, this uh, provides a better outcome as compared to monotherapy. These are the available drugs uh, according uh, to different pathways, uh, the endotherine pathway, the nitric oxide pathway, and the prostacycline pathway. For the nitric oxide pathway, we have PD5 inhibitors and the guanylate cyclate stimulators. And for prostacycline pathway, we have uh, uh, prostanoids or prostacycline analogs and uh, uh, the agonist of the prostacycline receptors like uh, uh, Selexipag. And this has been the improvement of the strategies. Uh, the drugs uh, should be utilized according to those strategies. So we started with monotherapy, we improved the with sequential combination, we improved also uh, when we started the initial combination, and now we have risk-oriented treatment uh, uh, strategy. And risk-oriented means that we combine the table for uh, the risk stratification and the drugs. So this is uh, the last version of the treatment algorithm, which require a confirmation of the diagnosis in X percenters. And then uh, in idiopathic uh, patients, uh, we need to perform the vasoreactivity test. Only few patients will be vasoreactive, but they will do very, very well with calcium channel blockers. Non-vasoreactive is the majority of the patients need to be treated with combination therapy. If they have high risk, the combination is triple initial with intravenous prostacycline analog. But this will be less than 5% of the patients. The majority will be at lower intermediate risk. Also, these patients need initial oral combination therapy with an endotrine receptor antagonist and the PD5 inhibitor. And then after three to six months of treatment, we need to restratify again the patient. If we bring the patients to low risk, continuation and follow-up is uh, uh, indicated. But if we have not reached the, the low risk profile, then triple sequential combinations, either with uh, a non-invasive treatment uh, like uh, uh, Selexipag or uh, with a more aggressive treatment uh, with uh, intravenous or subcutaneous is required according to the level of risk, either intermediate or high risk. Again, if a change has been implemented, a third stratification is required. And again, if we are still at intermediate or high risk, despite the triple combination, maximal medical therapy is uh, utilized, which includes uh, intravenous prostacycline analogs and listing for lung transplantation is required. As you can see, the treatment, uh, the therapy is not just a prescription. The therapy is a, a strategy and the strategy requiring sequential risk stratification. So these are the key messages. The diagnosis is the most important activity in pulmonary hypertension Echography, echocardiography estimate pH and not measure it. Right arc cut is mini invasive and require experience and expertise. The new pulmonary hemodynamic definitions need to be uh, still uh, in, in some way considered, but uh, the, the threshold for a prescription of the drugs remains uh, uh, 25 millimeters of mercury. These patients uh, need to be followed up with uh, uh, care. And uh, we should not give drugs uh, in patients uh, due to left heart disease and lung disease, unfortunately, because they not only are not effective, but may be dangerous. And chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension patients require a multidisciplinary team because uh, these patients require uh, surgical or interventional uh, therapies. And the, the pulmonary arterial hypertension therapy is not a prescription, but it's a, a strategy which requires reassessment, 
current PAH therapy is not able to cure the disease. However, it improves outcome if used appropriately. Despite the maximal medical therapy, uh, some patients uh, has to be considered as a candidate for lung transplantation. And uh, low-risk PAH patients uh, also are exposed to deterioration. So when the patient uh, has reached uh, the low-risk conditions, we need, uh, in any case, uh, to continue the follow-up. And shifting therapy between all our drugs are uh, absolutely have no evidence uh, of effect has not been tested in the traditional way of randomized and blinded studies, but only in open label studies of poor quality. Only three pathways have been addressed in PAH in the past 20 years. And then we are looking for a third, a fourth, or maybe fifth pathway to improve the prognosis of our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, that was very informative. Um, I think you nicely outlined an important message uh, and messages in it to be, uh, to be, to be accurate. The, I think for us as general pulmonologists, the most important message here is that pulmonary hypertension needs multidisciplinary approach and it needs specialized center. And it's important in the journey trying to diagnose the source of this pulmonary hypertension that we really rule out common causes. 80% of the causes is related to left heart disease, 10% uh, lung disease. It's really vital that we rule out chronic thromboembolic disease because this is a reversible um, uh, problem if we uh, detect it. And, uh, only the smaller fraction of those patients will need to go on to have, uh, once we suspect pulmonary arter arterial hypertension or its associated condition, such as the connective tissue disease, chestosomiasis, portopulmonary, HIV, pulmonary inclusive, only then we will be uh, thinking of more invasive procedures such as hemodynamic testing. Uh, professor, you also nicely uh, mentioned that it's important that we do risk evaluation, taking into consideration the clinical picture, the functional status of the patient, the simple testing such as six minute walk test and hemodynamics incorporate all of that to categorize patients into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. From your experience, how much can the general pulmonologist or internist detect before they end up uh, referring for a specialized center for, to, to diagnose pulmonary arterial hypertension? The, the role of uh, pulmonologists is important because uh, uh, at least 10% of the patients with pulmonary hypertension may have uh, uh, lung disease. Uh, and uh, it's important uh, for pulmonologists uh, to identify these patients. As, as we have seen, uh, it's not sufficient just to have normal volumes uh, to exclude the lung disease. And uh, this is not uh, clear for other specialties uh, like uh, cardiology or uh, other disciplines, uh, but it's very clear for, uh, from you. And this is uh, your contribution uh, just to uh, perform a more complete uh, 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 lung function test, including DLCO, and even and also high resolution CT scan to identify those patients, uh, which looks like idiopathic. But uh, when we perform uh, uh, DLCO and perform high resolution CT scan, we found uh, um, uh, important anatomical uh, changes. And then uh, it's important to continue the dialogue between cardiologists and pulmonologists, because as you have seen. The role of uh, hemodynamics uh, is important, and uh, this may in some way um, suggest to have a, a multidisciplinary team in any hospital in which uh, a consistent group of patients with pulmonary hypertension are followed up. Um, one of the things that unfortunately come across between now and then, we find somebody diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension from an echo, 
And then the next thing, they are started on sildenafil, for example, a PD, a PD5 inhibitor. And as you mentioned in your talk, sometimes the effect can be detrimental, especially if the cause of the pulmonary hypertension is left heart disease. Would you like to please elaborate more on this? Yeah, Why yeah. The, uh, the shortcut, the shortcut uh, be between echo and sildenafil is very well known uh, and is uh, absolutely to avoid because uh, first we don't know if the patient has uh, and which level of pulmonary hypertension has. Second, which type of pulmonary hypertension we are dealing with. And third, uh, the treatment of sildenafil may be dangerous. So we cannot afford to do this only because it's easy to prescribe sildenafil, it's also cheap and so on. So pulmonary hypertension of whatever type is a very severe condition, very. You have to consider that the pressure in the average case is increased by 200%. So imagine a systemic hypertension, which is 200% uh, higher than the normal. You will consider very severe this condition, but this is not recognized in PAH and is uh, absolutely not uh, sufficient uh, an echo to decide that this patient need uh, tre uh, require treatment. Is echo though a good tool to screen patients for pulmonary hypertension? Absolutely. And this is, uh, uh, in fact, the, the, the echo will stratify patients in low probability, intermediate probability, and high probability of pulmonary hypertension. And low uh, and intermediate um, and um, intermediate or high probability, this need to be screened, not those uh, at low probability. We, we don't need uh, to screen uh, um, everyone. Perfect. Uh, and I have uh, the last question from the audience, as simple as it may sound, but it has logic to it. And that is, you mentioned in your pathogenesis how occlusive the vascular uh, structure become in the lung. So you are a cardiologist, you dilate macro vessels. Why don't you dilate micro vessels? <laughs> it's very complicated because we are dealing with vessel lower, the, the diameter is, is lower than half millimeter. It's like hair, so it's uh, this is not possible. But uh, in CTF, we know are we know now are able to dilate vessel with uh, uh, up to uh, five millimeters uh, or four five millimeters. So we are we are there and we can dilate very carefully because it's not so simple to dilate uh, lung vessel. But uh, uh, we are uh, we are very happy with our program. Uh, because uh, we have avoided lung transplantation in many young individuals uh, with uh, distal CTF, which uh, 10 years ago, the only possibility was uh, lung transplantation. Today, with the balloon pulmonary angioplasty, they may normalize pulmonary arterial pressure. Well, I have to say we're lucky here in UAE. We have a very active uh, pulmonary hypertension group in our MLS Thoracic Society. We have Dr. Mohammed Badr al Sayari and Dr. Hani Sapur, and they are a combination of pulmonology and uh, pulmonary hypertension and uh, cardiology. And they're doing great job uh, trying to accumulate uh, the local experience and actually collaborating with other societies, like you're saying, they are uh, doing great work with the rheumatological society and uh, cardiac society. So I think this is a great collaboration we're seeing, which really goes in with your uh, advice. Professor I complete, completely agree with you because I know all the colleagues uh, in the, your geographical area and uh, it's one of the most advanced uh, uh, group uh, uh, treating, uh, dealing with pulmonary hypertension, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. It's so nice to see you and I wish you stay healthy and uh, happy. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.